Shalom Chavrim. It is always a pleasure to get to come and speak to you guys. And um, I really have something on my heart I wanted to share with you, a project that I am intending to, by God's grace, to bring out. It's actually a twofold project. One will be uh, a book that I am starting to write on now. I've mentioned to you writing about before, a, a not, it wouldn't be a huge book, at least I don't think it will be, on the identity of the Messiah. The different things that we find throughout the scriptures, uh, uh, through the words of Yeshua and the Christian Bible, the different things that the apostles recognize, the, the prophets uh, uh, that are written in, in, in the Torah, that identify who the Messiah is. Uh, things that Yeshua did himself, Jesus, he's done so many things that should have been obvious sign to Jewish people that he indeed is the Messiah. And yet today the Lord revealed another one to me. In fact, I, I think he had revealed this a little, little while back to me, and I may have even have already spoke about this, but it came to my heart again today. And so I thought what I would do I would take a few minutes of your time and I want to highlight a lot of the different things that God has placed in my heart to show you who the Messiah really is. Little things that happen, both back and forth from the things that Yeshua did, things that were written about him, and things that are written by the prophets, Moses and Zechariah, Ezekiel, different prophets, Isaiah. Uh, there are so many things that, as Jewish people, we should not, we should, we should know who the Messiah is by the simple prophetic things. Now, when I say to you a project, the project that I have on my heart is to make this a documentary. And I learned from a, a friend of mine, Lori Cadoza Moore. She had told me one time because I know her and her husband Stan. They have produced different documentaries, The Forgotten. Uh, people is my favorite of the work uh, that Lori has done uh, where they go into anti-Semitism and they're trying to keep it alive to, for the people to know that uh, it's certainly an ungodly thing that takes place. But in, in saying that, I asked Lori, how are you able to put all of the different footage in there? How do you get permission for all this footage? Because I know when I try to get permission from... Uh, um, from the uh, Paramount Pictures on the movie Defiance, it's like pulling teeth to do that. And uh, Lori shared with me though that as long as it's not for profit and it's for teaching purposes, you can use these things and it doesn't cost a thing to use it. You do not have to use royalties. Now you can't use it on the cover of a book or you couldn't use it in the opening part of your video, but you can use those excerpts as far as in the teaching. And so what I'm wanting to do is I want to take the different revelations that God has given me that identify the Messiah from the scriptures through the Bible, uh, the story of Joseph, uh, the story of David, Moses, all these different things that, that, that God has been so kind to reveal to me. And I want to put this into a, like a maybe a two-hour documentary, but giving you the visual effects to do that. Now, in order to do this, it has to be free of charge because it has to be not for profit. Now, we're not a 501c corporation and we have intentionally refused to be a 501c corporation because when you're a 501c corporation, you belong to the government. You cannot say what's really on your heart. And because of that, we pay a price here for it. We have to pay taxes on the donations that we receive as a result of that. But we take that and we just have to deal with that. So in order to be able to produce this and do it as a do it nonprofit, we will have to offer it free of charge. Uh, now the book I write is a little different. The book will not have excerpts of the different films that are out there, but we want to take the excerpts because like from the movie Joseph, uh, from the movie Defiance, from the movie of Moses, there are excerpts there that can give you the visual that would be an incredible witness tool to the Jewish people or, or any friends that you have, even, even Gentiles that have, that maybe question whether or not Yeshua really is a Messiah. It would give you a powerful tool to be able to witness to them. And so we'll need your help in doing that. And I just wanted to share that with you.
before we get started here. Anyway, I want to highlight to you some of the beautiful things, and I'll start off with the one that God just placed in my heart today. And like I said, it seems like for some reason he did this to me before and I had just forgot about it. But anyway, the question came up about, in my mind, I, it just come to my heart about Yeshua, Jesus, walking on the water. Now, some people get confused why I say Jesus and Yeshua at the same time. I do remember, and you guys, if you would, keep this in mind. There will be people that listen to this video for the first time that maybe doesn't know, don't, don't know much about the Hebrew language nor uh, Jesus' name being actually Yeshua in the Hebrew language. So I normally say them together. So if you would, bear with me on that. That's for the sake of those people that only would know the name Jesus. But anyway... Getting back to this thought right here. Yeshua, when he walked on the water, why did he walk on the water? Now, we know it was to get to the apostles. Naturally, they were in trouble and everything. But it has a deeper significance. You see, God brooded over the face of the deep, we find in Genesis. And here it was, again, he was showing who he was. Yeshua, Jesus himself, is identifying himself as the very God that was in Genesis that brooded over the water. This is why we find the Apostle, uh, excuse me, yeah, the Apostle John, when he writes about Yeshua, and he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later he goes down a few verses later, and he says, And the Word became flesh. And it always kind of got, got to me. Why does he say, in the beginning, in Hebrew we say, Barashit. In the beginning was the Word. So I thought to myself, what's the first word then that God says? In the beginning was the Word. So in other words, the first word that is in the beginning, what is that first word? And so I went back into Genesis and I began to look at it. Barashit bara In the beginning God created at the first. God created the heavens and the earth. And I get down to this one little place here and he says in there, Ve'yomer Elohim, and God, he said, Yahior. And so the first word that God says is, Yahior. Now, it's translated, let there be light, but it's deeper, it's richer in the Hebrew language than just let there be. It is the light is becoming manifested. Eternity is becoming manifested in a world in which we live in. No wonder why Yeshua says, I am the life. I am also a place in the scripture says he's the light. He's the truth and he's the way. Isn't it interesting? He is that light. Of course he's that light. John recognizes it over here in John 1, 1 there when he says in the beginning was the word. And he says the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What was that word? That first word from God was Ve'yomer Elohim Yahior. And it doesn't just stop there. It's just one after another after another. Like for the time I, I, I shared with you guys not long ago. Why did, why did Yeshua, why was Jesus, when he comes to the blind man that, that wants to receive his sight, and he takes and he spits on the ground until he makes a cake of mud or clay in this case here he turns that dirt into like a little clay lump because believe me if you go to spitting on the ground in israel it's very dry but once the ground there gets gets wet it's 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 like a gooey like it is like a clay type of texture to it and he puts it over this blind man's eyes and then tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. why did yeshua do this now, this man was born blind. So what was there about his lack of sight that wasn't there? Now, the scripture never tells us, you know, not, I mean, we see that he's born blind, was, but, but could it have been that part of the iris was missing or something like that? We don't know. But the reason why Yeshua takes and he anoints him with that clay on his eyes, I mean, you ever have dirt put in your eyes? Believe me, it doesn't feel good to get even one little grain in there. But I mean, he literally takes and cakes it over his eyes. Not his eyelids, his eyes. Why? He's showing to Israel that he is the God that formed Adam from the dust of the ground. He's identifying himself. 
When he says to the woman at the well, he says, if you knew it was that was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you water that you don't have to come here anymore. What is he doing? He's giving her a sign to recognize who he is. And she said, sir, you know, give me this water that I don't have to come to draw out the well anymore. He says, he said, from your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He was giving her a sign to look for. And did not Moses take the elders of Israel at the beginning of the wilderness journey and they go out and they say, the Lord says to them, go and take the elders of Israel and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters? Isn't it strange that the argument at the beginning of that journey was, is God among us or not? This is why they give it the name that they do. Because the argument is whether or not God is even among them or not. The argument when Yeshua was here is whether or not God is among them or not. The argument today is whether or not Yeshua is God himself manifested in flesh. In fact, Rabbi Singer, he may even watch this video. I know he's watched other videos. We have been talking privately about the identity of Yeshua. Who is he? Now, Rabbi Singer is very much staunchly opposed to anything Christianity. But... He sees, he's, he's going to get a presentation totally contrary to what he's used to, and he knows it. He knows that, and I have a deep respect for him. I think he's like Paul, the, or when Paul was Saul, he persecuted the church relentlessly. But Paul finds out, regardless of their mistakes, it was still, that was still his people. So Moses smites the rock. It brings forth its waters. What is Moses, what is God doing by having him smite the rock? Showing that the rock was going to be smitten. That rock represents Mashiach. The only way to bring forth the waters of life, the waters that was lost in the Garden of Eden, the very Spirit of God. Remember, I, now I showed you, I, I sit here and shared with you. He walked on top of the water to show that he was a God that in Genesis that was brooding over the face of the deep. Okay? He made the clay and put it on the blind man's eyes. Why? So that he could show that he was the very God that formed the Adam from the dust of the ground. He takes and he tells the woman at the well, I give you water that you don't have to come here anymore. And when he dies on the cross and they take and the soldier pierces his side, water and blood comes from his side and is separated, showing that the water of life was inside of him. The Spirit of God. After his resurrection, he takes, he breathes on his apostles. He says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Why did he do it that way? Why does he breathe upon them? He's showing that he was the very God in the Garden of Eden that breathed in the nostrils of Adam. What did he breathe in him? He was Eitz Chaim. Who do you think? I mean, you got to remember, there was the trees that could partake of any tree they wanted. And then there was a tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life, Eitz Chaim. Adam never partook of Eitz Chaim, neither did Eve. They didn't have to. God freely gave the Eitz Chaim when he breathed in his nostrils the breath of Chaim. The Hebrew Bible says Nishma Chaim. God had breathed in his nostrils his own life. The fruit from the tree of life was Chaim, God's own life. Who else could do it but God himself? And, and Yeshua is showing that he is that God standing there, breathing in the breath of life into him when he says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Everything testifies, every act that he did, everything that happens. You know, even the rabbinical brethren, they, they, they argue, you know, when it says that uh, he was thrust through. Or we, we translate it pierced a lot of times. Right, these are some of the sides there. But let me show you how the prophets testify. Now, this is just highlighting a few things, just a few. David, King David, a type of Yeshua, 
He goes and he, his own son of Solomon, which is named Avshalom, my father is peace, does not recognize his father to be, to be the king. And he, he leads a coup against him, turns the people against him, his own father. And instead of David rebelling, then his men even said, my King David, we will, you know, we're here to do whatever you want. These were great warriors. If they wanted to put down the coup, they could have put it down. Did not Peter do the same thing? Did he not cut off the high priest's servant's ear? Did not Yeshua say, did not Jesus say to him, put away your sword? Could I not call ten legions of angels even now? My father would give it to me and we would be able to put down the rebellion. But like David, no, he didn't do it. Why? And notice, David goes and he climbs up the Mount, uh, Mount of Olives and he turns around him and his men and they weep over, over Israel. David weeps over Israel, over his own son. Just like Yeshua does many years later, he weeps over Israel and he says, you know, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. David does the same thing. David, as he's leaving, who is it? Shimei meets him down, uh, Saul's son, and starts throwing stones at him and cursing them before. As they're coming, he's throwing stones at him and cursing them. As they leave, he's throwing stones and cursing them. And his man said, should I let this dog's head stay on his body? David said, leave him alone. God told him to do it. Why? Because he was typing out Yeshua, what Yeshua would happen to him. And they spit upon Yeshua. And Yeshua says, leave him alone. And he heals the man. Let him alone. And it's no strange thing about Shimei because we find in Zechariah 12, who is it? It is Shimei that, that, that is one of the, one of the sons. It is, a, it is the house of Judah. The very house of Israel is not there. But God said he's going to regather re the house of Judah again, bring Judah back in. That's why we find the all the families of, the, of the, uh, the family of David, the family of Nathan, which is the tribe of Judah, the family of Shimei, the tribe of Benjamin, the Levites, the family of Levi, the Levitical priesthood. Okay, my brother, such as uh, the different rabbis that, that argue this, that say that uh, the, the Pharisees have kept the order the entire time. Of course, God prophesied you would. Because he has to settle what Daniel's prophecy is. Daniel 9, 25, 26, and 27 and everything. which says he will bring it, make an end of sin and finish the transgression. Bring everlasting righteousness. If he's going to make an end of sin and to, to settle this iniquity issue and everything, then we must have done something wrong. No time in our history did we ever go into exile unless something went wrong. What went wrong 2,000 years ago then? Have we ever asked ourselves that? Have we ever taken and stopped for a few minutes and quit criticizing the Christian people and really try to figure out what went wrong? Not just try to justify ourselves. What happened when, when, when Absalomon died? Men are chasing him and he gets hung up in the tree. Gets his hair all caught up in the tree. And then David's men come around and they killed him. Mm. that's sad and you know the, the thing is you ever notice though, it's David's men that killed him they felt like they were doing an honorable thing it's the same thing with the Christian people do you not realize my Jewish brother that that right there David's men killing him you notice how that they, David's men always they, they wanted to take vengeance for David they're trying to do something themselves. Peter, the first believer in this, wanted to do something about it. Yeshua told him, put away your sword. It's not the way we're going to do it. David's men, though, the whole time, they're always wanting to settle the score for David. And while David's gone, it's David's men that kill Absalomon. Of Solomon is a type of Israel that rejected Yeshua. And unfortunately, it's also a prophecy that shows that the Christian people, those that would believe Yeshua to be Mashiach, they would be the ones to kill him. They would be the ones to persecute the Jewish people. And that's true. Absalomon was in the wrong. It is true. Absalomon, what he did was wrong. 
But look what David does when David comes back and he, and he gets the message that his son of Solomon is dead. He weeps before the Lord and he mourns and he cries out and he says, I would to God that I would have died for you, my son, if only I could. See, the thing is, is he couldn't do it. That used to bother me. Why would David weep like this over Solomon after the evil that he had done? It's because he's a type of Israel and David is a type of Mashiach, Yeshua. And Yeshua wept over Israel. But what David could not do, Yeshua could do. David, Yeshua could die and take Israel's place so that they would be redeemed. But sadly enough, my Christian friends, you are the type of his servants that killed him, that killed of Solomon. Many of the Christians that did not have the revelation, the true revelation of God's will, killed many of the, the Jewish people down through the ages. As a result. Now, even before though David could come back, David had to get everything in order. The people had to be in one mind and one heart and one accord. Isn't it interesting that David leaves behind two priests that represent the two witnesses? Isn't it interesting that Shemai is the first one to come out to repent and to ask David to forgive him? Isn't it interesting also though that David's men still wanted vengeance? So it's no wonder why we see many, now I don't say all Christian people because we know that there's not. There's many Christian people got the revelation that God has anointed Israel, that they're still chosen of God. But his own men still wanted to kill him. But David said, no, no one will die today. All the different types that are there, the story of Joseph, Joseph placing the cup in Benjamin's bag. Joseph's brothers, when he puts the money back in their sack and they're on their way back and his, and his brother opens up the sack and finds that his money is in, the, is in the neck of the sack and he's at a hotel when he does it. It's no mistake that this happens. Why? When Yeshua was in the belly of his mother, This is why the money is in the sack. This is why the food, the grain is in the sack as well. The word of God was in a sack. It was in the womb of his mother and he was rejected at a hotel. When there was no room for him in the end to be born, but instead he was sent to a stable. It's no wonder that the, the, the word order of the names of the sons that when, when Joseph's brothers, when they were rejecting Joseph when he come, they seen him afar off coming. They said, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and see what happens to his visions now. I can only imagine when Yeshua was on the earth that they felt the same way. Once he was killed, let's see if there's one stone left upon the temple. He said he would destroy this temple. Yeshua said there won't be one stone left upon another. Let's see if his words come to pass. Well, there's not one stone left upon another as far as the temple. He never said he would tear the temple mount down. He said there would not be one stone left upon another, speaking of the temple itself. Isn't it interesting, though, the things that happen? But when they do this, so Reuben... He's the one that was wanting to have mercy upon Yeshua, or upon Joseph. And his name means, behold, a son. When they go down, when they are starving, though, and they go down during the, the seven years of famine, which also types the 70th week of Daniel, they don't recognize their own brother. Why? Why don't they recognize him? It's the same thing with Israel. We don't recognize who Jesus is. We don't recognize him to be our brother. It takes two years into the famine before they begin to recognize who he is. It's when all these things begin to happen that start making sense. Come on, my brethren, wake up. These things have been happening for 2,000 years. Signs have been left for us. We should start recognizing something about this man named Yeshua. If Joseph's brothers could be standing there and see their money back in their sack and know good and well, something is wrong. 
Shouldn't we begin to recognize something then? Why then did he put the, you know, after, after this all happens, they come back down and, he, and they, they come the second time, they finally bring Benjamin because he said, you will not see my face until you bring your, old, your youngest brother Benjamin. Do you not realize the prophecy in this? Him as a type of Mashiach? And you were un, we have been unable for 2,000 years to see his face, to recognize him as Messiah for 2,000 years. Why? Benjamin has to be home. The innocent brother. The Jews of today that never took part in his death. And even when Benjamin comes, he doesn't recognize Joseph. Benjamin comes, he's sitting there, and, 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 he, and he sees all this extra blessing, but he doesn't know why. He has no idea. And then, again, he sends him out. And when he sends him out this time, then he binds Simon. It's no coincidence that Simon is bound. Simon means hears, or he hears. Simeon. The hearing of Israel was bound. Jesus even said, you have ears to hear but cannot hear. You have eyes and cannot see. Everything is being fulfilled that was seen by the prophets and the sages all the way down through everything, every, every story that we have throughout the Torah. It's been reflecting this man, Yeshua. David, Joseph, Moses. Everything. It's, it's just like crazy how much it reflects him. And then he takes, when, it, when, when, he, when he gets ready to send them off, he puts the cup in Benjamin's back. And there's so many purposes for that. One, it represents the fact that the Jews of today were not guilty of his blood 2,000 years ago. They put, he puts it in an innocent brother's back. But it also represents the fact that Benjamin, that tribe, would cry out for his blood in the future. Because why? The cup represents the communion cup where we rejected him at the communion table. Judas betrayed him at the communion table. This is why that's there. This is why we see Shimei written in Zechariah. Why the family of Shimei? Of all the families, why the family of Shimei? Because he's a Benjamite. And it was the Levites that went around talking the people in to accuse Yeshua. Who are they talking this into? There's only two tribes, Benjamites and Judas. The tribe of Judah, these two tribes here. And so when they cry, let his blood be upon us and our children. Our fathers were crying out for his blood to be upon us and our children. Why? So that the blood could be applied so that for the last 2,000 years, our ancestors would not be lost. No wonder why Joseph's brothers, when they take and they sell him out, they take and they kill a goat and they place the blood upon his coat, his long sleeve coat. And they take it back to his father and say, discern, is this your sons or no? Why do they take it to their father in the first place? Because Moses gave a command in the law. And this law, the commandment from the law that God gave for redemption is in the story of Joseph. It comes from the story of Joseph. The scapegoat and the sacrificial goat. The sacrificial goat that is poured out, the blood that is poured out, goes before God. It's an atonement for our sins. The other goat, the scapegoat, which was Joseph in this case here. Joseph bore the sins of his brothers far away. They were confessed upon him. As they laid their hands on him and did what they did, they were, their sins were being spoken audibly, what they had intended to do. And he bore that sin away from his father. But then... 
they take the other goat and they kill the kid of the goat and they pour the blood on his coat and take it to, a, to their father. This is what you have to do. This is what is required of God. And when we sacrificed Yeshua, Jesus, we laid our hands upon him and delivered him to the Romans for the Romans to kill him. But nonetheless, his blood is upon our hands. And we said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Had that statement not been made, then the blood could not have been applied. We meant it for evil. God applied it for our lives. There are so many more types. When you begin to look at the life of Yeshua and the things that happened and the things that He did, He was just trying to get us to see who He was. These little evidences that He's left behind, making the clay, walking on the water, He wasn't doing it just to go be for show. And then breathing on His apostles and saying, Receive you the Holy Ghost. We, we have longed to, to have eternal life again. And it's through the sacrifice that He made. All we have to do is believe on Him. Believe that He was indeed God in a human body. And don't say, please don't even try that. God cannot be a man. You know, I know the scripture, God is not a man. In other words, when we look at that scripture there, you don't, you don't reason with God like a man. It's not the way He is. But don't say that God can't become a man. Because if we try that argument there, we're denying the very prophet Moses that God sent to give us the law to begin with. Because Moses tells us in the story of Abraham that it was yod heh vav -Heh. It was Hashem himself that spoke to Abraham and said to Abraham, why did your wife, why did Sarah laugh and said these things cannot be? The one that stayed behind with Abraham was yod heh vav -Heh. It was Hashem. Don't say that God can't be a man. And don't say that, well, that's just a melech. That's just an angel. That angel was able to eat and drink. And he ate the meat from the kid that was slaughtered. He ate and drank the milk from the goat. There goes our kosher law, the way we translate the kosher law. But the thing is, is he can become a man. And the man, Yeshua, the reason why it is said he is the Son of God is because it's a body that God made for himself. Does it not say in our word, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made by hands, but a body hast thou made me. Did not our God say Himself, there is no Savior beside me. Then it was God Himself in that body called Yeshua. He says, I am your salvation. Isaiah 43, chapters 41, 42, and 43. So I don't bring you another God, but I declare to you that God Himself has manifested Himself in the form to be able to be the sacrifice to wash away our sins. And that by His blood, we, our sins are atoned. 
And that water that came from his side separately was to tell us. It was to show us that the Spirit of God, the waters of life that flowed freely from that rock in the wilderness, it was showing us that the Eis Chaim, the tree of life, he was that tree of life. And that in him was the life of Almighty God that restores us back to eternal life. See, we argued the fact, Yeshua says, that for us to know him, if a man would, would keep my saying, he shall never die. He's not talking about natural death. He was talking about eternity because the ultimate death is to die without that life. Do you see now why Ezekiel's prophecy, when they say our hope is lost? Do you not get, my Jewish brethren, that the, that, that the house of Israel actually realizes that without Yeshua, their hope is lost? Here they are, dead man's bones, but they're living somewhere. They're able to tell the prophet Ezekiel, our hope is lost. But then there was a rattling. God brings them back so they could take the tree of life and live. We have got to come to the realization. We need to take, and I, I adjure you, my Jewish brethren, I and sisters, I adjure you. Rather than constantly trying to fight the doctrines of Christianity, Forget the doctrines. Forget the Baptists, the Methodists, the Pentecostals, the Presbyterians. I understand all the problems that there are with the different doctrines. Do you think maybe you could go before Hashem and just sincerely ask Him, say, Lord, if Yeshua really is Mashiach, would you reveal this to me? Would you show me somehow, oh God, if this is your way to the tree of life, if he is that life, if, his, if your life was in this man called Jesus, please make it known to me. Reveal this to me, Lord. At least give God the benefit of the doubt to answer. And we don't have to worry about the different isms and schisms and everything else. I mean, you know, and, and we can't, you know, the, the old saying is in the south from Alabama where, where, I, where I've lived, pot can't call kettle black. You know, why? Are, are we any better? Do we forget that we had the different sects of religions when Yeshua come on the earth to begin with? We had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You had the Samaritans that had their own doctrine. Then we had the apostles that had their doctrine. Then John's followers had their doctrine. And then we hear that there was one, I forget the guy that was raised up that took so many that followed after him, they came to naught. Then we have the group that was they had the Dead Sea Scrolls, another doctrine. Yeah, we were all Jews. That's true. But just like the Christian people, we have a whole bunch of doctrines as well. We're not any better. And even today, we've got Reform, we've got Acidic, we've got Russian Orthodox, we've got uh, Haredi. Uh, come on! And we all have different interpretations of what the word means. And if that's not enough, read the Talmud for once in your life. Read the Talmud or the Mishnah or the Midrash. There's so many different opinions of what the Torah says. 663 mitzvot, and we have to have all these different opinions of what the mitzvot is? 
or what Ezekiel says, or, or, or somewhere along the way, God has just one way. The one time we believe that Moses was God's voice, God's mouthpiece to us. And we have all this evidence that lays before us. How do, how do, we, how do we deal with this? If Yeshua truly is that way back to God, to restore our relationship of eternal life, if this is what brings back what we lost, what our forefather Adam and Eve lost, and I mean, I mean, let's face it: what animal sacrifice can we offer that's going to restore God's life back into us? Which one? None of none of the lives. I mean, if the life of the animal came into you, I mean, what do you want to be an ox? You want to be a a dove? A goat, a lamb. We need God's life inside of us. And the only way we're going to get God's life in us is God has got to come and bring His life. He has to become that sacrifice. Does not David cry out in the psalm, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, the 22nd Psalm, I mean, my gosh, cannot we see this? Are we so blinded that we can't see that? Are we not willing to look? And don't say that, nowhere does it say that Mashiach was to come and, 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 and have to come again. Why do we even try such a foolish argument? When Daniel clearly says, the prince, and he says, the anointed prince, Mashiach, will be cut off, not for himself. If Mashiach is going to be cut off, and then we find that in the verse after that, that the temple is going to be destroyed by a prince, but there's no Mashiach with this prince, but we find out that this prince will come from the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which is a future prince. And we got a false prince coming. And Rabbi, Rabbi Singer, I don't know if you'll watch this video or not. I have no idea. You may. If you happen to see this video as well, let me just share with you another concern I have, my brother. And I think you know as well as I do, the Pope of Rome is about the biggest fraud that there is on planet Earth. But when I sit there in the Temple Institute and I listen to the, the, the tour guide speak, and I'm for building a third temple, but I'm very concerned about the words that are being echoed there at the Temple Institute, because to me it seems like that we are setting up a stage to allow the Pope to build our third temple. We say David couldn't build it because he was a man with blood on his hands. The only blood that he had on his hands that God would hold him responsible for was the blood of Uriah. Because he took an innocent man's life. But they bring out how that David was a man of war and he could not, that was the argument there, that he was a man of war and he had blood on his hand. And it was a righteous blood, but he still had blood on his hand. No, it was really the blood of Uriah that caused this. They said it had to be a man of peace. Solomon was a man of peace. And then I sit there and listen to the, to, to, to the brother say right there, and he's a, he's a brother to me, he's Jewish, he just doesn't realize what's happening, and he says Jerusalem is not even in the control or the hands of Israel. And then he tells me that the third temple cannot be built unless there is an agreement of all the nations, including the Palestinians. You're setting us up. For a covenant with Rome. And is it not obvious to us that Rome is getting control of Israel again? You know, we wanted to be delivered from the Romans 2,000 years ago. In fact, when Yeshua was here, everybody thought that he was going to deliver us from the Romans. I mean, come on, I hear the argument all the time. When the Messiah comes, the Messiah is supposed to bring peace and, and tranquility and everything is going to be all righteous and wonderful and good. That does happen, yes. It does. But, you know, 
don't think that Yeshua didn't know that this was a twofold purpose because when he reads Yeshayahu, Isaiah 61, he reads verse 1, half of verse 2, closes the book, does not read anything about the judgments, and he said, this day this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He even knew that he would come again. Daniel says he'll be cut off. The Moshiach, the anointed prince, would be cut off and not for himself. So we can't say that there's not scripture that shows that. So why don't we start examining these incredible, incredible prophecies that this man Yeshua fulfilled. And forget the, I mean, for, for just for a few minutes. You know, I realize, I mean, I've listened to the arguments before where we say that there are all these um, contradictions that are in the Christian Bible. And then we say, the Christians will agree there's no contradictions in the Torah. Of course they'll agree with that. They also believe there's no contradictions in theirs. But see, the thing is, you have to understand, the, the Tanakh is the foundation of their faith as well. And so they're going to defend the Tanakh as well. But we take the critics of, that are, the, critics of, of, of the Torah and the Tanakh, and they have a whole list of contradictions for us as well. But when we begin to say, no, that's not a contradiction, because we know the answer, we know how it fits together. The critic just does it just to say that there's contradictions. And of course, the Christians are not going to say there's contradictions in the Torah because it is their foundation book as well. But if you ever looked at the critic side of it, of course, you know, you know the critic side. Then why don't you take and give it an opportunity to set the story straight where there are critics, which are us, the Jews, that say that there's problems with the Christian Bible. I don't know why I went down this road. I was going to just highlight these things for you guys. But maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe one of my Jewish brothers or sisters will listen to this video. Maybe it'll be a first step. I love you guys. God bless you. If you want to be a, a part of this project, uh, I, th I think our site's going to be down for the next day or two, isareturns.com. Uh, we are switching servers to try to make things a little bit better that's going on in the background here. Uh, so you can also, though, if you're doing by, if you want to contribute by PayPal, you can actually just go to your PayPal and, and click in isareturns uh, at I don't know if it's done by email or not, but it's IsraelReturns at AOL.com if you want to email us or if you want to do that by PayPal. I know there's a way you can do that or IsraelReturns.com and it would automatically apply to us. Uh, or you can wait uh, either tomorrow late evening or the following day. The site will be back up and going again under the new server. And, uh, or you can uh, mail us here. Uh, in the United States, we have 12537 Gemstone Court, Fort Myers, Florida, 33. Uh, 913, the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And, um, but this is a project that I really want to do. And it will take many, many hours, uh, maybe even in well over 100 hours, I'm sure, to put this together. Uh, I am start, I already started on the book itself, uh, but I'm hoping that it will touch my people. And I'm hoping it will be a witness tool for you guys. Uh, not just for you, but it also, you know, it's funny, I was doing a video one time on being born again. It simplifies that as well. Being born again is far more simple than what we realize. And it's something for Jews that we have to have as well. Anyway, God bless you. We love you. And good night. Pray for us. We need your prayers. We really do. Anyway, oh, and one other thing. Let me mention this before I let you go. We are looking to do a tour through the United States uh, before we go back to Israel. Uh, so we'd be looking to do a tour. We haven't set dates as of yet. We wanted to take a couple of weeks and travel across the United States uh, visiting uh, groups to see, uh, and I don't know how to really put this plainly, but 
If you want to sponsor a meeting in your area uh, or like us to come to your area there to speak to a group uh, there, are a lot of different topics we'll be speaking on. Uh, and it's everything, everything from uh, equality as well as uh, prophetic things that are going on in Israel, uh, the identity of the Messiah, just whatever might be on your heart you'd like for us to speak on. Drop us an email. Let us know if you'd like to sponsor a meeting of us coming to your particular town. And we are looking at trying to do this sometime in probably the latter part of July to give you guys time to be able to let us know and to coordinate that. Um, but we want to try to go across the United States and visit with some people there. We are actually going to be back en route to Israel probably late August. Um, uh, we've got to go through Europe and then on into Israel. Uh, I want to go to Auschwitz because I've had such a large number of my family killed in Auschwitz. And so it's really been on my heart to go there to see uh, where so much atrocity happened. Anyway, I love you guys. God bless you. Uh, pray for my wife. She's not been feeling too well lately as well. Uh, I certainly love her, and she is such a vital part of this ministry. Uh, I don't think it's anything serious or nothing like that. I've just been feeling really fatigued, and probably a lot to do with the uh, coming back, changing the times and stuff. I know that's hard on the body, but if you would pray for my wife, uh, that God will make her feel better and to get her strength back. Baruch Hashem. God bless you. Good night.